This is section 24 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. Section 24. December 1865. Territorial Enterprise, December 8th through 10th, 1865. A Rich Epigram. Tom McGuire, torn with ire, lighted on McDougal, grabbed his throat, tore his coat, and split him in the bugle. Shame! Oh, fie! McGuire, why will you thus scaggle? Why bang and claw and gouge and chaw the unprepared McDougal? Of bones bereft, see how you've left Vest Valley, gentle Jew gal, and now you've slashed and almost hashed the form of poor McDougal. Territorial Enterprise, December 13th through 15th, 1865. Portion of San Francisco Letter, written December 11th, 1865. Christian Spectator. Reverend O. P. Fitzgerald, of the Minas Street Methodist Church South, is fairly under way now with his new Christian Spectator. The second number is before me. I believe I can venture to recommend it to the people of Nevada, of both northern and southern proclivities. It is not jammed full of incendiary religious matter about hell-fire and brimstone, and wicked young men knocked endwise by a streak of lightning while in the act of going fishing on Sunday. Its contents are not exciting or calculated to make people set up all night to read them. I like the spectator a great deal better than I expected to, and I think you ought to cheerfully spare room for a short review of it. The leading editorial says, A journal of the character of the spectator is always to a great extent the reflex of the editor's individuality. Then follows a pleasant moral homily entitled, That Nubbin, then puffs of a religious college and a Presbyterian church, then some poetical reflections on the happy fact the war is over, then a heist of some old slow coach of a preacher for not getting subscribers for the spectator fast enough, then a confidential hint to the reader that he turn out and gather subscriptions, and forward the money then a puff of the Oakland Female Seminary, then a remark that the spectator's terms are cash, then a suggestion that the paper would make a gorgeous Christmas present, <laughs> the only joke in the whole paper, and even this one is written with a fine show of seriousness, then a complimentary blast for Bishop Pierce, then a column of personal items concerning distinguished confederates, chiefly, then something about our new dress. Not one of Ward's shirts for the editor, but the paper's new dress. Then a word about our publishing house at Nashville, Tennessee. Then a repetition of the fact that our terms are cash. Then something concerning our head, not the editor's, which is level, but the paper's. Then follow two columns of religious news, not of a nature to drive one into a frenzy of excitement. On the outside is one of those entertaining novelettes, so popular among credulous Sabbath-school children, about a lone woman silently praying a desperate and bloodthirsty robber out of his boots, he looking on and fingering his clasp-knife and wiping it on his hand, and she calmly praying, till at last he blanched beneath her fixed gaze, a panic appeared to seize him, and he closed his knife and went out. Oh, that won't do, you know. That is rather too steep. I guess she must have scalded him a little. There is also a column about a remarkable police officer, and praising him up to the skies and showing by facts sufficient to convince me that if he belonged to our force Mr. Fitzgerald was drawing it rather strong. I read it with avidity, because I wished to know whether it was Chief Burke, or Blitz, or Lees, the parson was trying to curry favor with. But it was only an allegory, after all. The impossible policeman was conscience. 
it was one of those fine moral humbugs like some advertisements which seduce you down a column of stuff about general washington and wind up with a recommendation to try peterson's aromatic soap subscribe for the vivacious christian spectator c a close is financial agent more romance the pretty waiter girls are always getting people into trouble but i beg pardon i should say ladies not girls i learned this lesson in the days when i went gypsying which was a long time ago i said to one of these self-important hags mary or julia or whatever your name may be who is that old slab singing at the piano the girl with a bile on her nose her eyes snapped you call her a girl you shall find out yourself she is a lady if you please they all are ladies and they take it as an insult when they are called anything else it was one of these charming ladies who got shot by an ass of a lover from the wilds of arizona yesterday in the thunderbolt saloon but unhappily not killed the fellow had enjoyed so long the society of ill-favored squaws who have to be scraped before one can tell the color of their complexions that he was easily carried away with the well-seasoned charms of french mary of the thunderbolt saloon and got so spoony in his attention that he hung around her night after night and breathed her garlicky sighs with ecstasy but no man can be honored with a beer girl's society without paying for it french mary made this man vernon buy basket after basket of cheap champagne and got a heavy commission which is usually their privilege in the saloon her company always cost him five or ten dollars an hour and she was doubtless a still more expensive luxury out of it it is said that he was always insisting upon her marrying him and threatening to leave and go back to arizona if she did not she could not afford to let the goose go until he was completely plucked and so she would consent and set the day and then the poor devil in a burst of generosity would celebrate the happy event with a heavy outlay of cash. This ruse was played until it was worn out, until Vernon's patience was worn out, until Vernon's purse was worn out also. Then there was no use in humbugging the poor numbskull any longer, of course, and so French Mary deserted him to wait on customers who had cash the unfeeling practice always observed by lager beer ladies under similar circumstances. She told him she would not marry him or have anything more to do with him, and he very properly tried to blow her brains out. But he was awkward, and only wounded her dangerously. He killed himself, though, effectually, and let us hope that it was the wisest thing he could have done, and that he is better off now, poor fellow. Territorial Enterprise, December 16th and 17th, 1865 extract of original letter dated december thirteenth pertaining to theatre critics and the upcoming visit of edwin forrest san francisco letter managerial these mosquitoes would swarm around him and bleed dramatic imperfections from him by the column with their accustomed shameless presumption they would tear the fabric of his well-earned reputation to rags and call him a poor cheap humbug and an overrated concentration of mediocrity. They would always wind up their long-winded critiques, these promoted newsboys and shoemakers would, with the caustic, the cutting, the withering old standby which they have used with such blighting effect on so many similar occasions, to wit, if Mr. Forrest calls that sort of thing acting, very well, but we must inform him that although it may answer in other places it will not do here their grand final shot is always a six hundred pounder and always comes in the same elegant phraseology they would pronounce mr forrest a uh, bilk you cannot tell me anything about these ignorant asses who do up what is called criticism hereabouts i know them by the back Territorial Enterprise, December 1865. Thief-catching. One may easily find room to abuse as many as several members of Chief Burke's civilian army for laziness and uselessness, but the detective department is supplied with men who are sharp, shrewd, 
always on the alert and always industrious. It is only natural that this should be so. An ordinary policeman is chosen with a special reference to large stature and powerful muscle, and he only gets a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. But the detective is chosen with a special regard to brains, and the position pays better than a lucky faro bank. A shoemaker can tell by a single glance at a boot whose shop it comes from, by some peculiarity of workmanship, but to a barkeeper all boots are alike. A printer will take a number of newspaper scraps that show no dissimilarity to each other, and name the papers they were cut from. To a man who is accustomed to being on the water, the river's surface is a printed book which never fails to divulge the hiding place of the sunken rock, or betray the presence of the treacherous shoal. In ordinary men, this quality of detecting almost imperceptible differences and peculiarities is acquired by long practice, and goes not beyond the limits of their own occupation, but in the detective it is an instinct, and discovers to him the secret signs of all trades, and the faint shades of difference between things which look alike to the careless eye. Detective Rose can pick up a chicken's tail feather in Montgomery Street, and tell in a moment what roost it came from at the mission. And if the theft is recent, he can go out there and take a smell of the premises, and tell which block in Sacramento Street the Chinaman lives in who committed it, by some exquisite difference in the stink left, and which he knows to be peculiar to one particular block of buildings. Mr. McCormick, who should be on the detective force regularly, but as yet is there only by brevet, can tell an obscene photograph by the back, as a sport tells an ace from a jack. Detective Blitz can hunt down a transgressing hack-driver by some peculiarity in the style of his blasphemy. The forte of Lees and Ellis is the unearthing of embezzlers and forgers. Each of these men are best in one particular line, but at the same time they are good in all. And now we have Piper, who takes a cake, dropped in the lick-house by a coat-thief, and sits down to read it as another man would a newspaper. It informs him who baked the cake, who bought it, where the purchaser lives, that he is a Mexican, that his name is Salcero, that he is a thief by profession, and then Piper marches away two miles to the Presidio, and grabs this foreigner, and convicts him with a cake that cannot lie and makes him shed his boots, and finds two hundred dollars in greenbacks in them, and makes him shuck himself, and finds upon him store of stolen gold. And so Salzero goes to the station-house. The detectives are smart, but I remarked to a friend that some of the other policemen were not. He said the remark was unjust, that those other policemen were as smart as they could afford to be, for a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. It was not a bad idea. Still, I contend that some of them could not afford to be Daniel Webster's, maybe, for any amount of money. Caustic. Ah, but Fitz Smythe can be severe when it suits his humor. He knocks outcroppings as cold as a wedge in his last amigo letter to the Gold Hill News in a single paragraph, yet it cost you a whole page of the Enterprise to express your disapprobation of that volume of poems. He says, the contents are, of course, suited to the capacity of children only. This will make those Eastern papers feel mighty bad, because several of them have spoken highly of the book, and thought it was written for men and women to read. But I attach no weight to Smythe's criticisms, because he don't know anything about polite literature. He has had no experience in it further than to write up runaway horse items for the Alta, and act as private secretary to Emperor Norton and even in the latter capacity he has never composed the emperor's proclamations. His duties extended no further than to copy them for the Gold Hill News, and anybody could do that. As for poetry, he never wrote but two poems in his life. One was entitled The Dream of Norton I, Emperor, which was tolerably good, but not as good as the Chando's picture, and the other was one which he composed when the news came of the assassination of the president. This latter effort was bad, but I do not really think he knows it, else why should he feel so injured because it was not inserted in outcroppings? 
but perhaps it is not fair in me thus to pass judgment upon that poem when possibly i am no more competent to discern poetical merit or demerit than i conceive him to be himself therefore rather than do fitz smythe an unintentional injustice i will quote one verse from the poem which i have called bad and leave the people to endorse my criticism or reject it as shall seem unto them best the martyr gone 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 forever and forever gone 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 the tidings ne'er shall sever gone 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 wherever oh wherever gone 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 to his endeavor recapitulation gone forever to wherever ne'er shall sever his endeavor from our soul's high recompense i consider that the chief fault in this poem is that it is ill-balanced lopsided so to speak there is too much gone in it and not enough forever i will do the author the credit to say however that there is in it a manifestation of genius of a high order it is a dangerous kind of genius however as two poets here gifted exactly similar have lately demonstrated they both transgressed laws whereof the penalty is capital punishment i have to be a little severe now because i am a friend to outcroppings and i do not like to see you and smythe trying to bring the book into disrepute territorial enterprise december eighteen sixty five dated december twentieth eighteen sixty five the new swimming bath the new swimming bath in south park is attracting large crowds of curious visitors who are anxious to test its virtues but as yet it is not quite ready to be thrown open to the public the great bathhouse is finished however and this morning they are ornamenting its ample front with an immense painting representing men swimming in all manner of impossible attitudes it is as full of gorgeous coloring as a presbyterian picture of hell and is as good as a panorama to look at it promises to be a very popular institution the north beach and south park cars pass directly in front of it the eccentrics the eccentric fourteenth regulars is the gayest crowd of lads that any war ever did produce i suppose it is funny to read the accounts of their doings in the papers every day they are so supremely indifferent to consequences or public opinion or law or gospel the police the devil or anything else each happy fourteener sallies forth in a gang by himself like baxter's hog and in the course of an hour he has captured a horse or waylaid a stage-coach or carried off a showcase or devastated a dwelling or snatched a policeman or got a hundred and fifty people corralled in a narrow court where he guards the sole exit and entertains himself by charging on them with his bowie knife from time to time and laughing in his hoarse stormy way when they stampede oh they are gay i am really sorry to see that colonel drum is about to tone down the exuberance of the fourteeners and i am satisfied that my grief is shared by every reporter in town for three months ago the press oozed columns of the most insipid and resultless runaway beer-wagon items whereas lately it has scintillated with the most thrilling and readable exploits and adventures of the fourteeners colonel drum recommends to the commander of the department the limiting of passes to the issuance of not more than two at a time and chief burke i have no doubt will take care that the whole police force turns out armed to the teeth to look after these two the fourteeners have been accustomed to carnage and battle in the eastern wars so long that they don't mind a small squad of police at all look upon such as only a troublesome interruption to their amusements but not a positive obstruction territorial enterprise december nineteenth through twenty first eighteen sixty five portion of san francisco letter grand fete day at the cliff house performance to commence precisely at high noon the following celebrated artistes have been engaged at a ruinous expense and will perform the following truly marvelous feats pete hopkins the renowned spectre of the mountains will walk a tight-rope the artist himself being tighter than the rope at the time from the cliff-house to seal rock 
and will ride back on the seal known as ben butler or the seal will ride back on him as circumstances shall determine jim yoff will exhibit the horse petchum and explain why he did not win the last race harry covey will exhibit lodi and jim barton and billy williamson will favor the audience with their pedigree and sketches of their history not bene this will be very entertaining jerome leyland will exhibit the famous cow in a circus ring prepared for the occasion and perform several feats of perilous cowmanship on her back commodore perry childs will take a drink the weather permitting this was to have been done by another acrobat but he is out of practice and mr childs has kindly volunteered in his place Michael Reese will dance the stock gallopade, in which fine exhibition he will be assisted by several prominent brokers, after which Judge Bryan will sing two verses of Neapolitan by request. The whole to conclude with the grand tableau of the Children in the Wood, Children in the Wood, Emperor Norton and the Spectre of the Mountains. Territorial Enterprise, December 22nd through 23rd, 1865. McDougall versus McGuire. The talk occasioned by Maguire's unseemly castigation of McDougal, while the latter was engaged in conversation with a lady, was dying out, happily for both parties, but Mr. McDougal has set it going again by bringing that suit of his for five thousand dollars for the assault and battery. If he can get the money, I suppose that is at least the most profitable method of settling the matter. But then, will he? Maybe so, and maybe not. But if he feels badly, feels hurt, feels disgraced at being chastised, will five thousand dollars entirely soothe him and put an end to the comments and criticisms of the public? It is questionable. If he would pitch in and wail McGuire, though, it would afford him real genuine satisfaction, and would also furnish me with a great deal more pleasing material for a paragraph than I can get out of the regular routine of events that transpire in San Francisco which is a matter of still greater importance. If the plaintiff in this suit of damages were to intimate that he would like to have a word from me on this subject, I would immediately sit down and pour out my soul to him in verse. I would tune up my muse and sing to him the following pretty nursery rhyme. Come now, MacDougall, say, can lucre pay for thy dismembered coat, thy strangulated throat, thy busted bugle? speak thou poor w j and say i pray if gold can soothe your woes or mend your tattered clothes or heal your battered nose o bunged up lump of clay no arise be wise mcdougall damn your eyes don't legal quips devise to mend your reputation and efface the degradation of a blow that struck in ire but where of execration, unless you take your station in a strategic location, in mood of desperation, and lamb like all creation, this infernal Tom McGuire? Territorial Enterprise, December 24 or 26, 1865. Portion of a letter. San Francisco Letter. San Francisco, December 22nd. How long, O oh Lord, how long? discusses recent problems with local judge text not available editorial poem the following fine christmas poem appears in the alta of this morning in the unostentatious garb of an editorial this manner of setting it robs it of half its beauty i will arrange it as blank verse and then it will read much more charmingly christmas comes but once a year the holidays are approaching, we hear, of them and see their signs every day. The children tell you every morn how long it is until the glad new year. The pavements all are covered o'er with boxes, which have arrived per steamer and are being unpacked in anticipation sweet of an unusual demand. The windows of the shops, Montgomery Street along, do brilliant shine with articles of ornament and luxury. The more substantial goods, which eleven months now gone the place have occupied, having been put aside for a few revolving weeks, 
silks satins laces articles of gold and silver jewels porcelains from sevres and from dresden bohemian and venetian glass pictures engravings bronzes of the finest workmanship and price extravagant attract the eye at every step along the promenades of fashion the hotels with visitors are crowded who have come from the ultimate interior to enjoy amusements metropolitan or to find a more extensive market and prices lower for purchases than country towns afford abundant early rains a prosperous year have promised and the dry and sunny weather which prevailed hath for two weeks past doth offer facilities profound for coming to the city and for enjoyment after getting here the ocean beach throughout the day and theatres in shades of evening show a throng of strangers glad residents as well all appearances do indicate that this blithe time of holiday in san francisco will be one of liveliness unusual and brilliancy withal exit chief editor bowing low impressive music i cannot admire the overstrong modesty which impels a man to compose a stately anthem like that and run it together in the solid unattractiveness of a leading editorial facetious this morning's alta is brilliant the fine poem i have quoted is coppered by a scintillation of fitz smythe's in the same column he calls the thieving scallywags of the fourteenth infantry niptomaniacs that is not bad considering that it much more intelligently describes their chief proclivity than kleptomaniac describes the weakness of another kind of thieves the merit of this effort ranks so high that it is a mercy it is only a smart remark instead of a joke otherwise fitz smythe must have perished and instantly for fear that this remark may be obscure to some persons i will explain by informing the public that the soothsayers were called in at the time of fitz smythe's birth and they read the stars and prophesied that he was destined to lead a long and eventual life and to arrive to great distinction for his untiring industry in endeavoring for the period of near half a century to get off a joke they said that many times during his life the grand end and aim of his existence would seem to be in his reach and his mission on earth on the point of being fulfilled but again and again bitter disappointment would overtake him what promised so fairly to be a joke would come forth stillborn but he would rise superior to despair and make new and more frantic efforts and these wise men said that in the evening of his life when hope was well-nigh dead with him he would some day all unexpectedly to himself and likewise to the world produce a genuine joke and one of marvellous humour and then his head would cave in and his bowels be rent asunder and his arms and his legs would drop off and he would fall down and die in dreadful agony niptomaniac is a felicitous expression but god be thanked it is not a joke if it had been it would have killed him the mission of armand leonidas fitz smythe would have been accomplished mayo and aldridge the last news from frank mayo will be gratifying to his host of friends and admirers in california and nevada his rank is stock star and he plays the leading characters in heavy pieces and the boston papers say plays them as well as is done by any great actor in america and make no exceptions he traveled through the chief cities with the keens starring by himself in afterpieces and playing with the keens when there was no afterpiece taking such parts as henry the eighth the philadelphia papers said the keens were very well but mr mayo was the best actor in the lot Louis Aldridge, in his new Boston engagement, will take high rank also, and play first old men, and such characters. He will do well in the East. You never saw a man make such striding advances in professional excellence as Aldridge has done since he first played in Virginia. He holds over Mayo in one respect. He will study, and study hard, too. And Mayo won't. Financial in an editorial setting forth the palpable fact that california and nevada are cutting their own throats by their mistaken sagacity in hanging on to their double eagle circulating medium instead of smoothing the way for the adoption of greenbacks as our currency 
the flag touches upon several matters of immediate interest to Washu, and I make an extract. In the large city of Virginia, the San Francisco system of moneyed exclusiveness prevails completely. Two or three usurers have taken advantage of the necessities of the community, and, upon loans at exorbitant interest, obtained some sort of possession of nearly all of the real estate and house property in the city. The Bank of California, through its various connections, has worked itself into the proprietorship of the most valuable mines, and this has been accomplished by first depreciating the stock, and then buying it under the stress of a stock panic. Men who cannot sustain the depreciation, maintain their credit, and transact their business independent of a high value of their mining stock, must yield in order to ease their fall, and then, as they become ruined, they witness the outrage of their ruin, and retire in despair from enterprise and competition. The stock market has lately been unusually depressed. The California speculators and specific contract fellows of the two states have caused the depression, and now, having absorbed nearly all of the mining property, they are preparing to create a revival of stock speculation, whereby they will again deceive the public, realize enormous sums, and effect new ruin in every direction but their own. PERSONAL I do not know why I should head these two items from the call personal, but I do. THE TERRITORIAL ENTERPRISE this admirably conducted paper has entered on its eighth year of existence. Changed. The Virginia Union has changed from a morning to an evening paper. It manifests a restlessness which may precede speedy dissolution. Mock duel, almost. A French broker on Montgomery Street quarreled with his rival in a tender affair the other day, and a challenge passed, and was accepted. The seconds determined to merely load the pistols with blank cartridges and have some fun out of the matter, but they got to drinking rather freely, ran all night, and when the party arrived on the dueling ground at early dawn, the seconds were not sober enough to act their part with sufficient gravity to carry their plan through successfully. The principals discovered that they were being trifled with, and indignantly left the ground. I could get no names. All I could find out was that the seconds were two well-known sports, that the challenge was sent and accepted in good faith, and that one of the principals was a broker. More Wisdom The Alta is most unusually and astonishingly brilliant this morning. I cannot do better than give it space and let it illumine your columns. It lets off a level column of editorial to prove that bees eat clover, mice eat bees, Cats eat mice, cats bask in the sun, the spots on the sun derange the electric currents, that derangement produces earthquakes, earthquakes make cold weather, and the bees, and the mice, and the cats, and the spots on the sun, and the electric currents, and the earthquakes, and the cold weather, mingling together in one grand fatal combination, produce cholera. Listen to the Alta. We know that we have sometimes to go a long way around to trace an effect to its cause. Darwin, in The Origin of Species, states a fact which may be used with advantage in illustration, viz. The presence of a large number of cats in a village is favorable to the spread of red clover. The reader will at once exclaim, What on earth can cats have to do with that species of the genus Trifolium? The answer is, the humble bee, by a peculiarity of its organization, can alone extract the nectar from the flower of the red clover. In passing from flower to flower it conveys the pollen necessary for the fertilization and consequent spread of the plant. The field mice prey upon the humble bee, break up its nests, and eat its stores of honey, while the cats destroy the mice. Hence it follows that in the natural propagation of the plant in question, the feline tribe perform an important part. Bearing such curious revelations as these in mind, it is easy enough to present a theory to cover the case of Mother Earth at this time, namely, that the spots on the face of the sun derange the electric currents of the earth, that the derangement of the electric currents produces earthquakes, that earthquakes contribute to cold weather, by permitting the escape of some of the caloric of the interior of the globe, 
and that all these changes in some way are the cause of the rinderpest and cholera solomon's wisdom was foolishness to this mark twain territorial enterprise december twenty sixth twenty seventh eighteen sixty five portion of san francisco letter written december twenty third eighteen sixty five another enterprise a mr p m scoofy of this city has been raising oysters for two years past on the mexican coast and his first harvest eight tons arrived yesterday on the john l stevens they arrived in admirable condition finer and fatter than they were when they started for oysters enjoy traveling and thrive on it and they learn a good deal more on a flying trip than george marshall did and nearly as much as some other washoe of european tourists i could mention but they are dignified and do not gabble about it so much i would rather have the society of a traveled oyster than that of george marshall because i would not hesitate to show my displeasure if that oyster were to suddenly become gay and talkative and say i was in england you know by god i went up to liverpool and there i took the cars and went to london by blank blank i been in pall mall and cheapside and whitefriars and all of them places been in all of them i been in the tower of london and seen all them damned armors and things they used to wear in an early day i hired a feller for a shillin and he took me all around there and showed me the whole hell-fired arrangement you know by god and i give him a glass of off and off as they call it and he just froze to me you show one of them fellers the color of a bit and he'll stay with you all day by blank blank and i went to rome that ain't no slouch of a town you know and old blank blank you bet your life there ain't anything like it in this country you can't put up any idea how it is you can't tell a damn thing about rome without you see it by and i been to paris paris french call it you never hear them say paris they would laugh if they was to hear anybody call it paris you know i was there three weeks i was on the pont neuf and i been to the palais royal and the tuileries all of them damn places and the boulevard and the bois de boulogne i stood there in the bois de boulogne and see old louis napoleon and his wife come by in his carriage i was as close to him as from here to that counter there by god i see him take his hat off and bow to them whoopin french bilks by blank blank i stood right there that close as close as that counter when he went by i was close enough to a spit in his face if i'd a mind to by hell a feller might live here a million years and what would he ever see by god paris the place style there you know people got money there by blank blank let's take a drink by god i wouldn't let a traveled oyster inflict that sort of thing on me you understand and refer to the deity and to the savior by his full name to verify every other important statement i would rather have the oysters company than marshall's when his reminiscences are big within him but the moment i received the information that i been to europe and all them places by god i would start that oyster on a journey that would astonish it more than all the wonders of paris and all them damn places combined i have forgotten what i was going to say about mr scoofy and his mexican oyster farm but it don't matter the main thing is that he will hereafter endeavor to keep this market supplied with his delicious marine fruit and another great point is that his mexican oysters are as far superior to the poor little insipid things we are accustomed to here as is the information furnished by alexander von humboldt concerning foreign lands to that which one may glean from george marshall in the course of a brief brandy-punch tournament spirit of the local press san francisco is a city of startling events happy is the man whose destiny it is to gather them up and record them in a daily newspaper that sense of conferring benefit profit and innocent pleasure upon one's fellow-creatures which is so cheering so calmly blissful to the plodding pilgrims here below is his every day in the year when he gets up in the morning he can do as old franklin did and say this day and all days shall be unselfishly devoted to the good of my fellow-creatures 
to the amelioration of their condition, to the conferring of happiness upon them, to the storing of their minds with wisdom which shall fit them for their struggle with the hard world here, and for the enjoyment of a glad eternity hereafter. And thus striving, so shall I be blessed. And when he goes home at night he can exult and say, Through the labors of these hands and this brain, which God hath given me, blessed and wise are my fellow-creatures this day. I have told them of the wonder of the swindling of the friend of Bain, the unknown Bain from Petaluma Creek, by the obscure Catherine McCarthy, out of three hundred dollars, and told it with entertaining verbosity in half a column. I have told them that Christmas is coming, and people go strangely about buying things. I have said it in forty lines. I related how a vile burglar entered a house to rob, and actually went away again when he found he was discovered. I told it briefly in thirty-five lines. In forty lines I told how a man swindled a Chinaman out of a couple of shirts, and for fear the matter might seem trivial, I made a pretense of only having mentioned it in order to base upon it a criticism upon a grave defect in our laws. I fulminated again, in a covert way, the singular conceit that Christmas is at hand, and said people were going about in the most unaccountable way buying stuff to eat in the markets. Fifty-two lines. I glorified a fearful conflagration that came so near burning something that I shudder even now to think of it. Three thousand dollars' worth of goods destroyed by water. A man then went up and put out the fire with a bucket of water. I puffed our fine fire organization. Sixty-four lines. I printed some other extraordinary occurrences. Runaway horse, twenty-eight lines. Dog fight, thirty lines. Chinaman captured by Officer Rose for stealing chickens, ninety lines. Unknown Chinaman dead on Sacramento steamer, five lines several fourteener items, concerning people frightened and boots stolen, fifty-two lines, case of soldier stealing a washboard worth fifty cents, three-quarters of a column, much other wisdom I disseminated, and for these things let my reward come hereafter. And his reward will come hereafter, and I am sorry enough to think it, but such startling things do happen every day in this strange city and how dangerously exciting must be the employment of writing them up for the daily papers. Extraordinary Delicacy I spoke to you a day or two ago about the terrific panorama with which the proprietors of the new swimming-baths out at South Park have glorified the ample front of their building by way of a sign. It never entered my head that anyone's modesty would be shocked by that distressing caricature but we live to learn, and I was mistaken. Some of the citizens of that vicinage complain that the picture is obscene, and they have taken steps to present it before the proper authorities as a nuisance. Oh, but this is air-drawn delicacy. The dreadful picture is about thirty feet long and eight or ten feet wide. It is painted in defiance of all rules of art and the possibilities of nature. It represents a square tank as large as a plaza, and surrounded by long bulkheads of highly ornamental bathroom doors after the fashion of steamboat cabin architecture. At one end a fountain squirts a vast spray of water into the air. Here and there men are seen jumping from springboards into the great tank. Other men are swimming about in all sorts of attitudes except natural and passable ones. Two bald-headed patriarchs are skylarking around a small boat like a pair of schoolboys. Expensively dressed men are seen coming in to bathe, and other expensively dressed gentlemen are seen leaving the place after having performed their ablutions. The swimmers are the ones the fastidious South Parkers object to, yet they make exactly the same appearance in that picture that daring equestrians and acrobats do in the circus bills. They are dressed about the loins in an exceedingly short pair of pantaloons, and the remainder of their bodies is naked or clad in tights. It is impossible to determine which. Their legs look like prize carrots, though this is not a good flesh color. Wherefore, I think the bathman will be able to demonstrate, on his trial, that his model artists are necessarily dressed in tights, 
since nature never painted human legs of such a preposterous color. This will establish the fact that his sign is not indelicate, and he will be allowed to go free and be no further molested. You only need to look once at that barbarous piece of mud-daubing to appreciate the absurdity of anyone's modesty being offended by it. I have no doubt all those who are complaining of this sign went to see the Menken play Mazeppa in her much scantier attire, and blushed not. Territorial Enterprise, December 10th through 31st, 1865, portion of San Francisco Letter. A graceful compliment. One would hardly expect to receive a neat, voluntary compliment from so grave an institution as the United States Revenue Office, but such has been my good fortune. I have not been so agreeably surprised in many a day. The revenue officers, in a communication addressed to me, fondle the flattering fiction that I am a man of means, and have got goods, chattels, and effects, and even real estate. Gentlemen, you couldn't have paid such a compliment as that to any man who would appreciate it higher, or be more grateful for it than myself. We will drink together, if you object not. I am taxed on my income. This is perfectly gorgeous. I never felt so important in my life before. To be treated in this splendid way, just like another William B. Astor. Gentlemen, we must drink. Yes, I am taxed on my income. And the printed paper which bears this compliment, all slathered over with fierce-looking written figures, looks as grand as a steamboat's manifest. It reads thus. Collector's Office, U.S. Internal Revenue, 1st District, California. Name, M. Twain. Residence, at large. List and amount of tax, $31.25. Penalty, $3.12. Warrant, $2.45. Total amount, $36.82. Date, November twentieth, 1865. C. S. T. G. G. Deputy Collector. Please present this at the Collector's Office. Now, I consider that really handsome. I have got it framed beautifully, and I take more pride in it than any of my other furniture. I trust it will become an heirloom, and serve to show many generations of my posterity that I was a man of consequence in the land, and that I was also the recipient of compliments of the most extraordinary nature from high officers of the national government. On the other side of this complimentary document I find some happy blank verse headed Warrant, and signed by the poet Frank Soule, Collector of Internal Revenue. Some of the flights of fancy in this ode are really sublime, and show with what facility the poetic fire can render beautiful the most unpromising subject. For instance, You are hereby commanded to distrain upon so much of the goods chattels and effects of the within named person if any such can be found etc however that is not so much a flight of fancy as a flight of humor it is a fine flight though anyway but this one is equal to anything in shakespeare but in case sufficient goods chattels and effects cannot be found then you are hereby commanded to see so much of the real estate of said person as may be necessary to satisfy the tax there's poetry for you. They are going to commence on my real estate. This is very rough. But then the officer is expressly instructed to find it first. That is the saving clause for me. I will get them to take it all out in real estate, and then I will give them all the time they want to find it in. But I can tell them of a way whereby they can ultimately enrich the government of the United States by a judicious manipulation of this little bill against me, a way in which even the enormous national debt may be eventually paid off. Think of it. Imperishable fame will be the reward of the man who finds a way to pay off the national debt without impoverishing the land. I offer to furnish that method, and crown these gentlemen with that fadeless glory. It is so simple and plain that a child may understand it. It is thus. I perceive that by neglecting to pay my income tax within ten days after it was due, I have brought upon myself a penalty of three dollars and twelve cents extra tax for that ten days. Don't you see? Let her run. 
every ten days three dollars and twelve cents every month of thirty-one days ten dollars every year a hundred and twenty dollars every century twelve thousand dollars at the end of a hundred thousand years one billion two hundred million dollars will be the interest that has accumulated territorial enterprise december eighteen sixty five the black hole of san francisco if i were police judge here i would hold my court in the city prison and sentence my convicts to imprisonment in the present police court room that would be capital punishment it would be the spartan doom of death for all crimes whether important or insignificant the police court room with its deadly miasma killed judge shepherd and dick robinson the old reporter and will kill judge ricks and fitz smythe also the papers are just now abusing the police room a thing which they do in concert every month this time however they are more than usually exercised because somebody has gone and built a house right before the only window the room had and so it is midnight there during every hour of the twenty-four and gas has to be burned while all other people are burning daylight that police courtroom is not a nice place it is the infernalest smelling den on earth perhaps a deserted slaughter-house festering in the sun is bearable because it only has one smell albeit it is a lively one a soap factory has its disagreeable features but the soap factory has but one smell also to stand to leeward of a sweating negro is rough but even a sweating negro has but one smell the salute of the playful polecat has its little drawbacks but even the playful polecat has but one smell and you can bury yourself to the chin in damp sand and get rid of the odor eventually once enter the police court though once get yourself saturated with the fearful combination of miraculous stenches that infect its atmosphere and neither sand nor salvation can ever purify you any more you will smell like a polecat like a slaughter-house like a soap factory like a sweating negro like a graveyard after an earthquake for all time to come and you will have a breath like a buzzard you enter the door of the police court and your nostrils are saluted with an awful stench you think it emanates from mr hess the officer in charge of the door you say to yourself some animal has crawled down this poor man's throat and died you step further in and you smell the same smell with another still more villainous added to it you remark to yourself this is wrong very wrong these spectators ought to have been buried days ago you go a step further and you smell the same two smells and another more ghastly than both put together you think it comes from the spectators on the right you go further and a fourth still more powerful is added to your three horrible smells and you say to yourself these lawyers are too far gone chloride of lime would be of no benefit here one more step and you smell the judge you reel and gasp you stagger to the right and smell the prosecuting attorney worse and worse you stagger fainting to the left and your doom is sealed you enter the fatal blue mist where ten reporters sit and stink from morning until night and down you go you are carried out on a shutter and you cannot stay in the same room with yourself five minutes at a time for weeks you cannot imagine what a horrible hole that police court is the cholera itself couldn't stand it there the room is about twenty-four by forty feet in size i suppose and is blocked in on all sides by massive brick walls it has three or four doors but they are never opened and if they were they only open into airless courts and closets anyhow it has but one window and now that is blocked up as i was telling you there is not a solitary air hole as big as your nostril about the whole place very well down two sides of the room drunken filthy loafers thieves prostitutes china chicken stealers witnesses and slimy gutter snipes who come to see and belch and issue deadly smells are banked and packed four ranks deep a solid mass of rotting steaming corruption in the center of the room are dan murphy zabriskie the citizen sam platt prosecuting attorney louderback and other lawyers either of whom would do for a censor to swing before the high altar of hell 
then near the judge are a crowd of reporters a kind of cattle that did never smell good in any land the house is full so full that you have to actually squirm and shoulder your way from one part of it to another and not a single crack or crevice in the walls to let in one poor breath of god's pure air the dead exhausted poisoned atmosphere looks absolutely blue and filmy sometimes did when they had a little daylight now they have only gaslight and the added heat it brings another judge will die shortly if this thing goes on territorial enterprise december eighteen sixty five written december twenty ninth eighteen sixty five inspiration of louderback louderback prosecuting attorney in the police court has discovered something at last how it thrills me to think of it for two long years i have waited patiently for that man to discover something and he never could do it he has always gone through with his same old formula in every case before the court and has never shown any inclination to branch out into anything fresh that formula was as follows mr louderback addresses the witness did this all happen in the city and county of san francisco witness yes l you are sure of that now w yes sure l with severity remember you are on your oath we can't have any prevarication here you are certain it all happened in the city and county of san francisco w yes certain i know it did l to witness that'll do set down to judge your honor i don't think there is any use in hearing the evidence on the other side the defendant appears to be guilty as long as he flows along comfortably in that regular old groove of his louderback is bound to succeed is bound to succeed as well as he ever has done and why he should suddenly bulge out and go to discovering things in this startling and unexpected manner is a mystery to me and must be a source of distress and uneasiness to his nurse but here is what the call says a practice has obtained in the police court which will no doubt convince the public that san francisco practitioners are as shrewd as philadelphia lawyers it is a habit certain attorneys have of engaging to defend a person charged with some petty offense and getting some other person to represent them while they state to the court that they are retained on behalf of the prosecution and then have the court dismiss the case without investigation by stating there is no prospect of obtaining a conviction and that the time of the court would be needlessly occupied the prosecuting attorney has discovered the dodge and will hereafter resist all such motions the prosecuting attorney has discovered the dodge the prosecuting attorney discovered it good god territorial enterprise december thirty first eighteen sixty five portion of san francisco letter written december twenty eighth eighteen sixty five convicts some one i do not know who left me a card photograph yesterday which i do not know just what to do with it has the names of dan de quill w m gillespie alf doten robert lowry and charles a parker on it and appears to be a pictured group of notorious convicts or something of that kind i only judge by the countenances for i am not acquainted with these people and do not usually associate with such characters this is the worst lot of human faces i have ever seen that of the murderer doten murderer isn't he is sufficient to chill the strongest heart the cool self-possession of the burglar parker marks the man capable of performing deeds of daring confiscation at dead of night unmoved by surrounding perils the face of the thug de quill with its expression of pitiless malignity is a study those of the light-fingered gentry lowry and gillespie show that ineffable repose and self-complacency so deftly assumed by such characters after having nipped an overcoat or a pair of brass candlesticks and are aware that officers have suspected and are watching them i am very glad to have this picture to keep in my room as a hermit keeps a skull to remind me what i may some day become myself i have permitted the chief of police to take a copy of it for obvious reasons End of section 24